I was asked to come here and speak about creation. And I only have 15 minutes. I see the counting already. And I can, in 15 minutes, I think I can touch only a very, a rather janitorial branch of creation, which I call creativity. Um, creativity is how we, how we cope with creation. While creation sometimes seems a, a bit ungraspable or even pointless, creativity is always meaningful. Say, for instance, in, in this picture, you know, creation is what put that dog in that picture, and creativity is what make us see a chicken on his headquarters. <laughs> when, when you think about, you know, creativity has a lot to do with causality, too. You know, when I was a teenager, I was a creator. Uh, I just did things. When I became an adult and started knowing who I was and tried to maintain the persona, I became creative. Um, I, you know, I, it wasn't until I actually did a book in a retrospective exhibition that I could track exactly, it looks like all the crazy things that I had done, all my drinking, all my parties, they found the straight line that brings me to the point that I'm actually I'm talking to you at this moment. Um, <laughs> well, it's actually true, you know. I, the reason I'm talking to you right now is because I was born in Brazil. If I, was, if I was born in Monterey, probably I'll be in Brazil. Um, I, you know, I was born in Brazil and grew up in the 70s under a climate of uh, political distress. And I was forced to learn to communicate in a very specific way, in a sort of a, a semiotic black market. You couldn't really say what you wanted to say. You have to invent ways of doing it. And you didn't trust information very much. That led me to Another step of why I'm here today is because I really liked media of all kinds. I was a media junkie and eventually got involved with advertising. My first job in Brazil was actually to develop um, a way to improve the readability of uh, billboards and based on speed, angle of approach, and actually blocks of text. It was, it was very, actually it was a very good study and got me a job in an ad agency. And they also decided that uh, I had to, to give me a very ugly plexiglass trophy for it. <laughs> and another point why I'm here is that the day I went to pick up the plexiglass trophy, I rented a tuxedo for the first time in my life, picked the thing, didn't have any friends. On my way out, I had to break a, f a fight apart. Somebody was hitting somebody else with brass knuckles. They were in tuxedos and fighting, very ugly. And also, uh, advertising people do that all the time. <laughs> and I, well, what happened is, when I went back, was on my way back to my car, the guy who got hit decided to grab a gun, I don't know where he had a gun, and shoot the first person he decided to be his aggressor. The first person was wearing a black a, a tuxedo. Uh, it was me. Luckily, it wasn't fatal, as you can all see. <laughs> And even more luckily, the guy said that he was sorry, and I bribed him for uh, compensation money, otherwise I pressed charges. And that's how, with this money, I paid a, a, a ticket to come to the United States in 1983, and that's very, the basic reason I'm talking to you here today, <laughs> because I got shot. Well, when, um, I started working with my own work. I decided that I shouldn't do images. You know, I became, took this very iconoclastic approach. Because when I decided to go into advertising, I wanted to do, um, and I wanted to airbrush naked people on, on ice for whiskey commercials. That's what I really wanted to do. <laughs> but I, they didn't let me do it, so I just, you know, they only let me do other things. But I wasn't into selling whiskey. I wasn't into selling ice. Uh, the first works were actually objects. It was kind of a mixture of found object, uh, product design, and advertising. And I call them relics. It, they were displayed first at Stux Gallery in 1983. This is the clown skull. It's a remnant of a race of, very evolved race of entertainers. They lived in Brazil a long time ago. <laughs> this is the Ashanti joystick. Um, Unfortunately, it has become obsolete because it was designed for Atari platform. Um, a PlayStation 2 is in the works. Maybe for the next TED, I'll, I'll bring it. The rocking podium. This is the pre-Columbian coffee maker. Actually, the idea came out of an argument that I had at Starbucks that I, I insisted that I wasn't having Colombian coffee. The coffee was actually pre-Columbian. The bonsai table. <laughs> the entire Encyclopedia Britannica bound in a single volume for travel purposes. 
and a half tombstone for people who are not dead yet. <laughs> so, I wanted to take that you know, into the, Im the realm of images, and I decided to make things that had the same identity conflicts. So I decided to do work with clouds, because clouds can mean anything you want. Uh, I wanted, but I wanted to look, work in a very low-tech way, so something that would mean at the same time a lump of cotton, uh, a cloud, and Durer's praying hands, although this looks a lot more like Mickey Mouse's praying hands. Um, but I was still, you know, this is a kitty cloud. <laughs> They're called equivalents after Alfred Stiglitz's work, uh, this nail. But I was still working with sculpture, and I was really trying to go flatter and flatter um, the teapot. I had a chance to go to Florence um, in, I think it was 94, and I saw uh, Ghiberti's Door of Paradise. And he did something that was very tricky. He put together two different media from different periods of time. First, he got you know, no age old uh, way of making images, which was relief. And he worked this with a uh, three point perspective, which was brand new technology at the time. And it's totally overkill. And your eye doesn't know which level to read, and you become trapped into this kind of representation. So I decided to make these very simple renderings that at first you, they are taken as a, a line drawing, you know, something that very, I did them with, and then I did them with wire. The idea was to, because everybody overlooked white, uh, like pencil drawings, you know, and they would look at it, ah, it's a pencil drawing, and then you have this uh, double take and see that it's actually something that existed in time, it had a physicality, and you start going deeper and deeper into a sort of narrative that goes this way uh, towards the image. So this is a monkey with Leica. <laughs> Relaxation. Fiat Lux, and the same way the history of representation evolved from line drawings to shaded drawings, and I wanted to deal with other subjects, I started taking that into the realm of landscape, which is something that's almost a picture of nothing. I made these pictures called Pictures of Thread, and I named them after the amount of yards that I used to represent each picture. This always end up being a photograph at the end, or more like an etching in this case. So this is a lighthouse. Uh, this is 6,500 yards after Coho. <laughs> 9,000 yards after Gerhard Richter. And I don't know how many yards after John Constable. <laughs> Departing from the lines, I decided to tackle the idea of points, like, which is more similar to the type of representation that we find in photographs themselves. I had met a group of children in the Caribbean island of St. Kitts, and I did work and play with them. I got uh, some photographs from them. Upon my arrival in New York, I decided they were children of plantation, sugar plantation workers. And by manipulating sugar over a, a black paper, I made portraits of them. These are, thank you. It says Valentina de Festas. It was just the name of the child with the little thing you get to know of somebody that you meet very briefly. Valicia. Jacinta. But another layer of representation was still introduced. Because I was doing this while I was making these pictures, I realized that I could add still another thing. And I was trying to make a subject, uh, something that would interfere with the, with, the, with the theme, so chocolate is very good because it, you know, it, has, it, it brings to mind <laughs> ideas that go from scatology to romance, and so I decided to make these pictures, and they were very large, so you had to walk away from it to be able to see them, so they're called pictures of chocolate. Freud probably could explain chocolate better than I was the first subject, and Jackson Pollock also. <laughs> Pictures of crowds are particularly interesting because you know you go to that, you try to figure out the threshold with something that you identify very easily, like a face goes into becoming just a texture. Paparazzi. Uh, I used the dust of the Whitney Museum to render some of pieces of their collection. And I picked minimalist pieces because they're about uh, specificity. And you render this with the most known specific material, which is dust itself. Like, you know, it has the skin particles of every, every single museum visitor. You know, they, they do a DNA scan on this. They would come up with a great mailing list. 
This is Richard Serra. I bought a computer and told me it had millions of colors in it. Uh, you know, an artist's first response to this is, like, who counted it? You know? I, and I realized that I never worked with color because I had a hard time controlling the idea of single colors. And, but once they apply it to numeric, to numeric structure, then you, you, can, you feel more comfortable. So the first time I worked with colors was by making these mosaics of Pantone swatches. They end up being very large pictures. And I photographed with a very large camera, eight by 10 cameras. So you can see the surface of every single swatch of people, like in this picture of uh, Chuck Close. And you have to walk a lot, very far to be able to see it. Uh, also, the reference to Gerd Richer, uh use of color um, charts. And the idea also, to, also entering another realm of representation that's very common to us today, which is the bitmap. I ended up uh, narrowing the subject to Monet uh, haystacks. This is something I used to do as a joke, you know, make uh, the same, like uh, Robert Smith's in Spiral Jet, and then leaving traces of, the, as if it was done on a tabletop, like trying to prove that he didn't do that thing in the South Lake. <laughs> but then, just doing the models, I was trying to explore the relationship between the model and the original, and I felt that I would have to actually go there and make some earthworks myself. I opt for very simple line drawings, kind of stupid looking. And at the same time, I was doing this very large construction to be 150 <laughs> meters away. Now, I would do very small ones, which would be like, uh, but under the same light. And I would show them together, so the viewer would have to really figure out what was he was looking. I wasn't interested in the very large things or in the small things, but I was more interested in the things in between, you know, because you leave an enormous range for ambiguity there. This is like you see the size of a person over there. Uh, this is a pipe <laughs> uh, hanger. And this is another thing that I did, um, you know, working, I think in draw, everybody loves to watch somebody draw, but not many people have a chance to watch somebody draw in, in like a lot of people at the same time to evidence a single drawing. And, I love this work because I, I did this cartoonish clouds over Manhattan <laughs> for a period of two months. And it was quite wonderful because I had an interest, an early interest in theater that's justified on this thing. In theater, you have the character and the actor in the same place trying to negotiate each other in front of an audience. And in this, you'd have like um, something that looks like a cloud, and it is a cloud at the same time. So they're like perfect actors. <laughs> my, my, yeah, my interest in, in acting, especially bad acting, goes a long way. Actually, <laughs> I, I once paid like $60 to see a very great actor to do a version of King Lear. And I felt really robbed, because by the time the actor started being King Lear, he stopped being the great actor that I had paid money to see. <laughs> On the other hand, you know, I, I've, uh, I paid like $3, I think, and I went to uh, a warehouse in Queens to see a version of uh, Otello by an amateur group. And it was quite fascinating because, you know, the guy was named was Joey Grimaldi. He impersonated the Moorish general. He, you know, the first three minutes, he was really that general. And then he went into Becky the plumber. He was, was a, worked as a plumber, so plumber, general, plumber, general. So for, for three dollars, I saw two tragedies for the price of one. <laughs> see, I, I think uh, you know, it's not really about impressing or making people fall for a really perfect illusion as much as it is to make, I usually work at the lowest threshold of a visual illusion because uh, it's not about fooling somebody, it's actually giving somebody uh, a measure of their own belief, how much you want to be fooled. That's why we pay to go to the magic shows and things like that. Oh, I think that's it, my time is nearly up. Thank you very much. Yeah.